Thank you very much for that generous welcome. Um, I'm reminded of a moment during the liberation struggle in South Africa, if you followed two presentations like what you heard from Christian Amonpo and Chortel Ejefo, you started by saying, most of the really good points I wanted to make <laughs> have been eloquently made by the previous speaker. And then you said, however, for emphasis, and then you spoke for about three hours. <laughs> Churchill's reflection on education just forces me to just share with you my first protest at the age of 15, marching against the inequality in education, where the slogan at the front of the march was, we want equality, but this time the slogan got to the back of the march, the 12-year-olds were chanting, we want a color TV. <laughs> uh, because kids in white schools had color TVs and kids in black schools had no TVs. And if I'm brutally honest, at that time in my life, I wanted a color TV and equality probably equally. <laughs> but friends, I am these days more and more nervous when I stand up to speak to any audience because, for example, I was speaking in the US and I was looking at the current moment of history that we're in, where we see a convergence of crises, where we see a financial crisis, a poverty crisis, an inequality crisis, and of course, an existential climate crisis, all converging at the same time. Some of us have called it a perfect storm, some have called it uh, a boiling point. So as I was banging on about analyzing the world, I could just see the audience getting more and more depressed. And when it came to the Q&A time, a woman put up her hand and said, Dr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And I said, yes, you know, he deeply informed many people in my country in our struggle against apartheid. And then she said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? Thinking it was a trick question, I answered very gently. I said, I, I have a dream. And she shouted back, yes! It was I have a dream, but when I hear you speak, you have a nightmare, the forests are collapsing, <laughs> everything is dying. So the challenge of leadership and the challenge of changing narratives is about finding the right balance today between speaking truth to power, not sanitizing the deep, deep crisis that humanity finds itself in, but doing it in a way that also inspires, energizes, activates, rather than create a message that things are so desperately bad, so let's just go home and chill out. But the moment we live in is one where we are seeing high levels of what a philosopher friend of mine calls moral panic. There are three trends that we would be deeply unwise to ignore. We are seeing the rise of authoritarianism in a very fundamental way. You know, it is Bolsonaro, it is Putin, it is Erdogan, it is Modi, and of course it's Trump. By the way, for those of you who are not from the US here, you remember those days when we said, how could the US electoral system give us George W. Bush? <laughs> My God, we'll have him back anytime right now. <laughs> the second trend is deepening oligarchic wealth, right? The deepening inequality. And the third is xenophobia. And these three trends are now globally connected. They are infusing each other. And underlying all of this is the uncomfortable reality of climate change. So when we had the global financial crisis in 2008, for example, the World Economic Forum, leaders in business, and so on. What were their approach? It was system recovery, system maintenance, and system protection. But what we need to learn about the current system that is driving humanity to destruction is what we need is system redesign, system innovation, and system transformation. Re sorry, sorry, please, please don't clap. I've got a clock that's ticking away there. So rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic is absolutely a betrayal of our children and their children's future. Martin Luther King, speaking in the mid-60s, said, 
My friends, I note that in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Now, all of us want to live a well-adjusted life and not suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you, there are certain things in our world that are so moral and unjust that good, decent people should refuse to be well-adjusted to. He went on to say, I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry, to racial discrimination, to the mindless expenditure on military equipment when people have no food to eat. And importantly, he said on the economy, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. If that was relevant in the United States in the mid-60s, it's a thousand times more relevant in the United States today as it is for everywhere in the world that we are seeing an unsustainable level of inequality. In a longer version of the speech, he then says, I now call upon decent men and women around the world to come together to create a new global movement to be known as the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. <laughs> that movement was never formed, but that movement is happening all over the world, and I hope that's called World Forum will be part of the movement of saying the status quo is broken, the status quo must be challenged, and what we need to do is not make baby steps in the positive direction. We need to make fundamental change if we're going to ensure that humanity is delivered a safe future. And to meet this challenge, we also need to recognize some of the mistakes we've made in the past for those of us who have sought justice. One of the mistakes we've made is we have often thought that governments who are inclined to oppress and control, as well as big corporations who are inclined sometimes to exploit and destroy, that they control us primarily through the deployment of what you could call the repressive state apparatus, army, police, formal use of laws and so on. Of course, that does offer quite a lot of control on what you can do and you can't do. However, the more powerful form of control is what you could call the ideological state apparatus. That is, the framework for education, the framework for schooling, the framework, sorry, uh, for religion, and importantly, the framework for the media and how certain s social norms and so on are either buttressed or undermined. And so when we look at that, we need to recognize that the people in this room, right, are extremely powerful. But I want to quote with fondness Steve Bannon. <laughs> when, he said, when he says, sorry, not a direct quote, I agree with him fully that politics does not make culture. Culture leads politics. And they've understood that much better than people on the progressive side of history have understood it. And therefore, as culture makers in this room, as entrepreneurs, as people working in the movie uh, and, and, and uh, other parts of uh, the media industry, we need to recognize that this is a time for creative maladjustment. Because if simply we respond to the madness of the leadership that we have at the moment and think that we are going to deliver a world of peace and sustainability for the future, then we are making a very, very big mistake. And, you know, in this new context, we're seeing micro-targeting on social media. By the way, I heard under really good advice that Bolsonaro, Trump, Putin, Erdogan, uh, Orban in Hungary, and a few others, they have a WhatsApp group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they're all cheering, uh, and, and, and uh, the crown prince in Saudi is, is, is the moderator of that group. <laughs> but, but, so, so basically, I think the forces of negativity and the forces of injustice and division and hate are much more savvy about using the media tools that are available to us than we are at the moment. I know that's not a nice thing to say in a place like this, but all I'm saying is we need to be much, much more better, much, much more creative, much, much more bold, and we must be willing to recognize that the stories that reside in what we do, in what we see in our work and so on, are powerful. 
And here I would like to quote an African brother, Ben Okri, when he said, Beware the stories you tell, subtly at night. Beneath the waters of consciousness, they are altering your world. And there are wonderful stories like the boy who harnessed the wind. But I was saying to Chuetel area, actually, much as I was very moved by watching this movie a couple weeks ago, I suddenly thought about this other movie that moved me, 12 Years a Slave. And then suddenly I thought, where did I hear this year, where did I hear 12 years recently? Anybody remembers 12 years has been used recently? When in October, the climate scientists tell us that we have 12 years to get emissions to peak and start coming down by 2030, we need to reduce our emissions by 50% based on 2010 levels, otherwise we are on the route to catastrophic, irreversible climate change. 12 years, of which one year is almost gone. We should be shaking in our boots. We should be saying, what kind of civil disobedience do we need to engage in to actually get our leaders to stop? And who are rising up? Who are rising up to meet this challenge? Who? It's our children. A 15-year-old girl in Stockholm, Greta Thunberg, a couple months ago, when the forests are burning, decides, I want to do something. She goes outside the parliament, launches Fridays for Future as an hashtag, without no money, no institution, and so on. And today, that is one of the most powerful expressions of the climate movement, where we're seeing our children saying, we are going to keep protesting until our parents behave like adults and recognize. Because you see, what, what some of these kids told me, you know, when we were growing up, our parents always told us, don't go by fire. Fire is dangerous, right? Now, our whole house is on fire, and our parents are actually taking a, a sleep and are letting politicians get away with it. And by the way, these young children are amazing in the creativity. I marched here in London with them, and the signs are just like, so one of the signs says, keep Earth clean, it's not Uranus. <laughs> the other one, as we march past Downing Street, you know, where the cabinet sometimes meets, the kids, the kids, well, I said the cabinet sometimes meets because, you know, we don't even know whether it's a fully-fledged cabinet there at the moment. But one of the kids, two young girls picked up a sign as we marched past saying, you can get better cabinets at Ikea. <laughs> so, so those voices are the voices that we need to elevate in our cultural production at the moment. We have to be thinking about how we do not accept that what is coming from those in power is the best that humanity can be. And as we close this Call World Forum this year, we need to say, we need to communicate in ways that we, deliver, uh, that we celebrate our shared common humanity. That we refuse to let those who can only govern and who can only win elections by using xenophobia, racism and misogyny, as we have seen from the United States to Brazil and to many parts in Europe and elsewhere right now. We need to say that we are not going to respond with it. We don't have to. And now I'll say the unpopular thing. If we are going to shift the moment of history that we're in, all of us here yeah, and everywhere who calls ourselves progressive and so on, we have to learn to love the people that voted for Trump. We have to learn to love the people that voted for Brexit. We need to learn for the people who voted for the most backward, backward thinking people and not write them off with the people that they were manipulated by to vote and act in certain ways. We don't have a choice. The numbers are too many. And if we cannot find the humanity in the people that have drifted in a direction of negativity, that is on our watch, that is on our responsibility, that creativity of winning people back to a view of decency, of equity, of justice, and so on, it's doable. It's our challenge, and if we fail to do it, let's be bold enough to say we have failed, rather than pointing fingers to say that the right has won. <laughs> and, and so, as I conclude, 
Let me just say, we must recognize that if we are going to win, we need to address one of the difficult problems that we don't talk about. And that is to recognize that the worst disease that humanity faces right now is a disease, not HIV AIDS, not cancer, not influenza, it's a disease you could call affluenza. It's a pathological illness where people believe that a meaningful, decent life only comes from more and more and more material acquisitions. Unless we ourselves liberate ourselves from that thinking and then think about how in a finite planet, in a finite planet, we use the resources that are available in the planet in a more equitable way, in a more shared way, if we don't make those big changes, the good news is the planet is fine. You don't need to worry about saving the planet. The planet is absolutely fine because if we continue in the way we are, the end result is we will be gone, the planet will still be here. The good news is once we become extinct as a species, the forests will recover, the oceans will replenish, and so on. So understand that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is about whether we are willing to say we are prepared to put our children and their children's futures ahead of any other interests, that in fact it is about securing their futures and to ensure that we make whatever changes necessary, however big, however bold, however systemic, however structural, we will make those changes because our children deserve much, much better than that. Now, I want to end with a quotation from... Uh, well, first let me just note that for organizations like Amnesty and many other civil society organizations in this room, this is a very difficult time. In more than 80 countries around the world, there are attacks on the space of civil society. Every week, on average, according to Global Witness, four environmental activists get killed on average uh, somewhere in the world. Um, for Amnesty, in India, our offices have been raided, uh, bank accounts frozen. Turkey, our folks have been in prison. The chair of the board of, uh, of, uh, has been in prison for 14 months. He's been uh, released, uh, thankfully. Uh, I can walk you around the world just with amnesty, but all civil society organizations are facing lots of challenges at the moment. Why would I end on this? I want to end on it as a positive note. Because Mahatma Gandhi once said, first, they ignore you. Then, they laugh at you. Then, they fight you and then you win. My dear brothers and sisters, the good news is they're not ignoring us, they're not laughing, us, laughing at us, they're fighting us and they're fighting us really hard and if Gandhi was right, let's hope we are just one step away from winning justice for everybody on this planet. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you ask me a question. Okay. I will ask them a question. Tell them I have one question for them to So, while you're standing, I have one question for you. And that is, how many of you know where your ancestors come from? And go as far back as you can. As far, far back as you can. Okay. Quick. Illinois? Illinois? Italy. Oh, sorry. Italy. Okay, now. Italy, Italy, sorry. I want you to go way back. Anybody else? There's, okay, there's some white people here saying Africa. Okay. So why do you say that? Because it's true. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, it's beyond reasonable doubt that humanity started on the African continent, from the Rift Valley in Kenya all the way to Ethiopia. Folks, you know ended up moving to Australia and working their way back to Europe, and I'm sorry, along the way, some of you lost your color. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, 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 so just to, to say, you know, in Africa, in the, anything that we're fighting for, whether it's education, health, against HIV, AIDS, however depressing it is, we never end a great gathering like this without a song. So I'm going to take a risk and teach you a song to end, which has just two words, 
Pambili Africa, which is forward with Africa and given that all of you are Africans because that's where your roots are. Uh, we can end on that if that's okay. Well, uh, this wasn't scripted, by the way. It just moved. <laughs> They're panicking. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> so just two words. Eh? Pambili, 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 Pambili. Pambili i Afrika, Pambili, 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 Pambili i Afrika. Okay, everybody now. Pambili, 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 Pambili i Afrika. Pambili, 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 Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice job. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.